If you've been a close follower of this channel for a while now, or even of the SCP Foundation archive as a whole, then there's a pretty high chance that you might have heard of SCP-096. Even if this just so happens to be the first of our SCP videos that you've ever clicked on, you still might have seen the Shy Guy itself in various other corners of the internet. Since the earliest days of the SCP Foundation, SCP-096 has gradually become one of the most iconic and recognizable creatures in the Foundation's entire menagerie of anomalous beings. Despite standing taller than any ordinary person, you might be forgiven for mistaking SCP-096 for a human being if you were to see it at a distance, but the creature is unusually proportioned, to say the least, still appearing almost human in its shape, but possessing long, dangling arms that almost reach the ground. SCP-096's body is thin and hairless, with opaque, clear white pupilless eyes and a wide, gaping mouth. Or so we've heard, thanks to drawings provided by someone who, sadly, isn't with us anymore. But you might be surprised to learn that SCP-096 doesn't really do all that much. Mostly, the tall, spindly humanoid spends its days walking mindlessly, pacing around in its containment cell. Sounds like most days in a college dorm during lockdown, right? That is, of course, until someone dares to look at SCP-096's face. It doesn't have to be directly either. It can be something as simple as glancing at a photo or watching a video of the creature. But the moment it is seen, the exact second it is perceived, the wiry monster will know. Having its face viewed in any way will cause the Shy Guy to really live up to its nickname. The creature suffers some sort of psychological meltdown, covering its face with its huge claw-like hands and weeping. SCP-096 quickly becomes utterly inconsolable, suffering from extreme emotional distress until it simply can't take it anymore. Pulling itself up to its full, looming height, SCP-096 will stand and travel at impossible speeds towards the person that dared look at its face. There's no way to hide from the Shy Guy. Nothing can stand in its path as it tracks down this unlucky person. And when it finds them, well, it's certainly not pleasant. Somehow, without leaving any trace on their body, SCP-096 will kill the person that looked at it, possibly even eating them afterwards. Then it calms itself down, returns to its more docile state, and is typically bagged and brought back home by whatever mobile task force is closest. SCP-096 has killed many of the teams sent to contain it, proving itself to be resistant to gunfire and any forms of conventional weaponry. As much as being only a tiny speck in a photograph, that is enough to trigger the creature's relentless defense mechanism. Nobody can get away from it either. There is literally nowhere in the entire world that someone can run to escape SCP-096. Not even crossing the oceans or jumping aboard a plane is enough to stop it. And if our Community Questions video on the matter is anything to go by, you may not even be safe in outer space. The SCP Foundation's only real way to keep the creature safely under wraps and contained is to lock it up and force all members of personnel to never, ever look at it while they hunt down any pieces of recorded media still out there, waiting like a ticking time bomb. So if no member of the Foundation can look at SCP-096, how do they interact with it? Well, luckily, there's a tale that answers exactly that, known as a lesson in power. Dr. Danielle Kowalski, a member of the Foundation's research team assigned to SCP-096, was sent into the creature's cell wearing a sleep mask, you know, the kind you get on expensive flights. What she was really wishing for, though, was a gas mask to go with it. Nobody had warned her how bad SCP-096 smelled. Then again, few had been as close to the creature as she had and lived to tell the tale. As a child, Danielle Kowalski had a fear of stepping into the ocean. Her mother used to warn her about treading on a stingray and dying as a result, giving her a phobia that stayed with her for many years. But Danielle's father had encouraged her to face her fear, to shuffle her feet on the ocean floor, kicking up sand so that the stingray would know she was coming and would simply just swim away. Perhaps if he could have seen what kind of horrors Danielle was working with at the Foundation, her father wouldn't have tried to make her so fearless. Maybe there are some things that it's logical to be afraid of. Entering SCP-096's cell, Dr. Kowalski could hear the monster's heaving breaths, the perfect mix between a frightened whimper and a death rattle, the haunting sound of a person's final gasp of air. In the back of her mind, Danielle hoped she didn't touch the creature by accident, 
The closer she got, the tension and the heat of its warm breath against her skin was making the approach all the more terrifying. She had been issued with an instant camera and took a photo in the dark. Click. The flash fired, but with her eyes covered, she couldn't tell. That was good, though. That was the point. If Danielle could see the flash going off, she could see what else was in the room, and that would put her in even more danger. She was locked in with the kind of stingray that wouldn't swim away, even if it knew she was there. Slowly, Dr. Kowalski began blindly photographing the cell around her, stuffing each freshly printed photo into her pocket as the camera spat them out. Over the span of 45 minutes, she took a series of pictures of the entire cell until the film in the instant camera had run out. Danielle knew that she would probably only need one picture, but better to have more just in case. Luckily, none of her Foundation colleagues were around to tell her how insane what she was doing actually was. They were all preoccupied, preparing the site for its first official visit from the FBI. This all took place after what was known as the Broken Masquerade had taken place. Essentially, knowledge of the SCP Foundation and its research into the endless stream of anomalies it had contained was all made public. People knew the truth now, and the Foundation found itself in the one place it never wanted to be. The public eye. The organization and its activities were under the scrutiny of every journalist on the planet, and once more information about the SCPs and the anomalous world of the Foundation became known, the world would surely change forever. Danielle Kowalski knew all of this and told herself that everyone would need something for protection now. She only hoped her photographs would be enough. Fifteen months later, Dr. Kowalski was interrogated in her apartment by one Agent O'Brien. He and a group of fellow agents had barged into Danielle's home, demanding to know the location where a number of SCP-610 specimens were being held. SCP-610 being, of course, the infamous infection known as the flesh that hates, a disease capable of turning human beings into horrible, deformed monstrosities of flesh. Agent O'Brien, and presumably whoever he was working for, was intent on turning these creatures into weapons, and the man had little patience for a former Foundation researcher who wasn't giving up the answers that he wanted. Danielle tried to argue with the agent, citing the Berlin Accords Against Weaponized Anomalies, a motion proposed to the United States Senate that would forbid the use of anomalous objects, entities, and creatures as weapons for any country. O'Brien wasn't interested. He claimed that if the Kremlin and Russia had no intention of ratifying such a law, then America wouldn't either. The agent had his men grab Danielle by her arm, while he grabbed her right middle finger and began to push a thin knife under her fingernail. The former member of the Foundation tried to stifle her scream, but couldn't stop herself as the pain struck. As Agent O'Brien tortured Danielle, he told her that the Russians had all the information they would need about SCP-610 in order to turn the flesh into some kind of weapon. As far as he was concerned, the United States government needed access to those SCP-610 specimens to know exactly what they would be up against in the likely event that Russia used the flesh that hates against them. And only a researcher for the SCP Foundation, the former senior researcher on the SCP-610 project, would know where to find those specimens. You don't think it's reasonable for the United States government to want to understand what could be used against us? O'Brien asked as Danielle's blood trickled out of her finger into his leather gloves. <laughs> Hell, I don't care what you think we're gonna do with it. I want those specimens. When the agent finally let her go, Dr. Kowalski tried to catch her breath, forcing herself not to scream in pain again. She pointed with her other unharmed hand to her bedroom, telling O'Brien to check the bottom left drawer. She had placed a manila envelope in there, containing the only thing Danielle had kept since departing the SCP Foundation. Under O'Brien's orders, his men ransacked the nearby room and were quickly able to find what they were looking for. The envelope was presented to Agent O'Brien, who was no doubt expecting to find a file inside, something that detailed the exact location of those specimens he was looking for. So you can probably imagine the dissatisfied look on his face when he opened the envelope to find photographs. A collection of instant photos, all taken in a dark cell, with all of them depicting a tall, thin, humanoid creature. A being with long, dangling arms that almost reach the ground, a thin, hairless body, opaque, pupilless eyes, and a wide, gaping mouth. Furious to once again be denied the information he was looking for, 
O'Brien disregarded the pictures and burned Dr. Kowalski's neck with his cigarette. In his anger, he said, I think your foundation should have thought they were powerful hiding in the shadows, but I'd like to explain to you why you're wrong. The agent then went on to describe his time as a member of the DEA in the late 1980s and how he'd been involved in the hunting of notorious cartel boss Pablo Escobar. I had a narco in custody, every bit as uncooperative as you are now. The man had insisted that Escobar owned all of the Colombian law enforcement, but a young girl O'Brien had argued that if that was the case, and they possessed all this power, then why did Pablo Escobar's men hide their guns? Why smuggle drugs in secret and bury their money where no one would find it if they really had the control they claimed? Much like Escobar's cartel, the SCP Foundation had always moved in the shadows, a power that O'Brien believed to have really belonged to the government. Your anomalies belong to us. Your research belongs to us. Your life belongs to us, he told Dr. Kowalski. Suddenly, one of the other agents noticed movement outside of the apartment. The second that Danielle saw a long arm face through her wall, with gray skin like that of a corpse, she snapped her eyes shut. O'Brien and his men drew all their guns and opened fire on the monster that had walked through the wall as if it wasn't even there. All the while, Danielle Kowalski kept her eyes shut. The sounds of screaming and snapping bones and a sickening slurping noise filled the air, but she made sure not to look. Within a few quick moments of panic and agonizing pain, it was over. The apartment was quiet, apart from strange breathing, like a mix of a frightening whimper and a death rattle. Run along now, 096, Dr. Kowalski told the shy guy. There are worse monsters in this world than you.